Let's put from to cut, please. All right, hi everyone. My name is Anna. I'm from James Conway's group at the University of Pittsburgh. And today I'm going to be talking about the assembly of a T equal sign vector phase called D3. All right, so D3, like like all tailed bacteria phages and herpes viruses is made up of the HK97 fold, the capsid. Um, so today we'll be talking about a number of these different uh, domains that you see here, uh, maybe modeling that, that occurs within them. Uh, so the HK97 fold is set up into pentamers and hexamers, of course, and then we have a diagram of that in uh, HK97 theory on here. Uh, we won't actually be talking about the mature form of the fold, though. Um, we'll talk about it in one of its initial pro forms, which looks similar, but a little bit different. Um, and what is particularly different is uh, the scaffolding domain. Uh, so this is an alpha fold model. Uh, it's been unable to be captured uh, with structural methods uh, thus far, although um, sort of the end of it uh, has been, we'll be talking about that. And we'll be, pick, to be talking about its, its influence on, uh, on the capsid. All right, so before we get to that, of course, just need to briefly go over, go over T numbers, um, although not too much. Um, so today's talk will be on a T equals nine um, capsid. Uh, and like I sort of briefly mentioned in the uh, questions of all of this talk, um, this capsid type hasn't been characterized too much, probably just from lack of sampling. Um, but uh, it's an interesting capsid geometry, and we're interested in how the HK97 fold, which has traditionally been characterized in T equals 7, um, so works in a, in a T equals 9 system. So the stage is called D3. Uh, it's a pseudomonas stage, uh, it's a Cephoverde stage. And it shows about 50% uh, sequence identity of its major capsid protein uh, with the HK97. Uh, and like HD97 uh, viruses, um, it undergoes a similar maturation pathway where we see uh, two procapsids. The initial procapsid that's formed, called ProCapsid 1, or ProCapsid 1, uh, contains the scaffold domain that I talked about. Uh, it is not a separately encoded scaffold like some um, capsids. Uh, it's it's um, Fully um, on the major capsid protein. It is cleaved though um, into the second pro capsid form. That undergoes expansion and then DNA packaging and then later assembly um, of the rest of the page components. So, due to the hard work of others in the lab uh, that are not me, uh, we've worked to um, produce uh, the, the pro capsids, so the Um And I've been doing work to uh, model them. Uh, so we have quite a few structures here, and even more so than these, um, and lots of interesting stories that we can tell. But for the purpose of time today, we're going to be talking about what facilitates the T equals 9, and for that reason, uh, I'll just be talking about ProHead 1 and ProHead 2, although well, mostly just ProHead 1. All right, so a bit bigger view of ProHead 1 here. I have it centered on the Icosa uh, yeah, threefold here. Uh, the uh, dash lines connect the pentons. And like Oliver introduced us to you, uh, we see two different types uh, of hexons, interestingly, with, with different shapes. Oops, and made them a bit faster, but that's okay. Uh, so, same orientation of the capsid. Uh, we just come out together here. So we have our pentons, and then these two different types of hexons. Uh, a number of people of papers have come out over the past few years. Um, and as it goes, all of us are calling these different things. Uh, so the hexon in the middle, um, that's just the cooling cleaner. Um, they've also been called uh, central hexons as well. So I call them that, or just the hexons on the acrosophageal threefold. And then these are um, the ones that are bent on proximal I have here. Uh, they've also been called edge hexons, uh, or the winged hexons. So like I mentioned, we, uh, with Pyre, we are working to determine the differences between these. Um, 
as well as a variety of structural features of uh, these different hexagon types and how they relate to the geometry and assembly. So, I, the thorough question here is what facilitates the T equals 9, but, but we, we'd rather know that. That's the extra hexagon. I guess a few papers have come out recently about that. It's actually not, not our T question. Uh, our T question is what's regulating this T equals 9, what enables it uh, to form. And so, to look at that, we're again at our third head one, but now we've sliced it in half. So, what you can see here uh, are these interesting internal densities. Uh, and these are the scaffold domain that I talked about. And here again, I have uh, the alpha fold model. So, uh, this is the cleavage site. This region up here is associated on the major capsid protein. I'll have more figures later on to look at it. Uh, and then this is this whole region uh, is predicted to be a um, big coil that was multiple, that assembled into multiple coil coils. Uh, so as you may have noticed in the, in the last slide, uh, that scaffold gets lost in some ways uh, during the reconstruction, um, most likely due to its inherent flexibility. Though, if we look at it at low resolution, um, there's still some interesting uh, morphology we can see. So I have a movie here, um, at a low resolution version of the capsid, where we can see um, some bundles of it. This is a movie, it's supposed to play. Let's try. There we go, thank you. <laughs> um, there's a hexagon types out there. Um, you may notice some, some different orientations of these low resolution bundles. Right, so we see three distinct organizations um, under our different capsular types. So under our pentons, uh, we see number one, oh, number one here. Um, we see this sort of rather symmetrical looking um, shorter bundle. Uh, hexons that are proximal to the pentons, we see distinct bundles of three uh, coming down. These are the ones that are, that are more skewed, um, so it's always one with what we see on, on the hexon. And then under our central hexons, um, we see, uh, again, quite a symmetrical, uh, long, rather stable looking uh, bundle. But at high resolution, we lose these, but we don't lose uh, this region up here um, that we think is, is pretty key in uh, that of size. So this is that region. So inside our scaffold domain, uh, we have our long coil coil position, but then we also have that, that upper region, which is made up uh, of an alpha helix and a beta strand. It's also what's seen in HD97. So on the left here, uh, this is a view from the inside of the capsid. We've taken a slice of the edge of it, um, looking from inside up to it. Uh, you can see these um, so alpha helix and beta strand is flat against the major capsid protein. And just an angled version of that. And if we look at one single subunit, that's what we see. Uh, so we see the beta strands, loop, and alpha helix. And I have a sort of bottom down view uh, to show this, this loop, which we um, think is actually quite significant part of it. So we've been asking questions of how is the scaffold domain influencing the structure of the rest of the subunit and what happens uh, after it's cleaved. So to so investigate the first part of that, uh, we've compared cohead one and cohead two, which is after the scaffold domain has been um, completely removed. A video of that. Maybe there's some, some changes initially here. Um, and the two biggest ones we see are uh, constraints on the helix. Uh, so it seems like the, the scaffold domain here is pulling uh, that helix into a little more of a bent form. And we also see um, quite a bit of reorganization of um, the P domain or the P loop. Um, I'll talk about these more going forward. But this region, um, looking at the whole, um, the whole organization, the, the P domain is the region in between different subunits uh, where they're connecting. 
so we compared ProHead 1 and ProHead 2. Uh, so we have further questions, of course. Uh, so we're curious, you know, how is HPN Angus doesn't fold? Um, how the scaffold in it is varying between types of different sizes. Like, so we're interested in P plus 9, P plus 7, how is that facilitated? Um, and what's the difference in, in our uh, subunits? So to look at that, uh, we've been comparing ProHead 1 of P3 as well as HPN 7. And they look quite similar, particularly uh, up top here in this A domain and the E loop. Um, but we do see some differences that may not be looked so cute at first, but we actually think are. Um, so we see a bit of a different orientation of the helix, a little bit there. Um, but what we particularly notice, of course, is uh, the difference in this loop. It's about three times the size uh, in D3. And this region is close to that, that P domain. Um, of, of the whole subunit. Uh, so we suspect uh, that this, this extra loop is adding a vector space in between um, our customers and likely being influential in, in size determination. Uh, so of course, the rest of the uh, scaffold uh, is, of course, um, going to be involved in that. We think this is just probably a key player. So if that is the case, um, so we can look at our pro head twos after that scaffold domain has been cleaved um, to see what's happening in our subunits at that point. There we go. Uh, so, I have the pro head two, and after the scaffold has been, has been fertilized and removed, as well as uh, an H27 pro head two. Uh, this is from the recent paper of Dorothy and Fred and all of us. Um, I encourage everyone to look at looking at H97 per head 2 in its portal. Uh, and let me just play that again. Uh, so, what's remarkable here is exactly how identical it is. I think it's quite remarkable. Uh, I've highlighted here that these, uh, these subunits are from capsules of, of quite different sizes, T plus 7, T plus 9, yet they're really quite identical all throughout, even in that central spine helix. Um, and even this highly flexible the P loop domain. Uh, it's quite, quite striking. Uh, so, uh, we've also questioned what facilitates the T equals 9, but what we're really interested in is what, what's regulating uh, that T equals 9, what, what's enabling it to form. So, it appears to be um, this sort of capture associating part of the scaffold, uh, we think is a key player. Uh, it also keeps us in the fact that ProHead 1 is really the fundamental stage of assembly. Because uh, when you go into the pro head 2 stage, those subunits become almost identical, yet they've got completely different uh, geometries. So some key areas of remodeling that we know this um, are in the scaffold domain itself, that, that quite different uh, key domain um, associated loop. Um, and we're really interested in how this um, varies between other capsids, larger capsids. I uh, was interested in sort of the overall shape of this. And on P22, it's a uh, helix uh, helix, so quite a, quite a small loop right at the bottom there. Um, we're interested in how various of the different shapes and sizes uh, with scaffold uh, compare them. But now, as we see, uh, quite a difference in, in spine helix orientation. Um, as I said, the P domain. Uh, just a similar sentiment. Uh, we think that scaffold is. is um, and you think it's based on the capsid initially during assembly, uh, and it's acting as a pretty, pretty key regulator uh, as a mechanism of size determination. Uh, what I have down here is just a bit of a schematic. Uh, so they're illustrating differences between T plus 7 and T plus 9, um, and used largely by that scaffold domain we talked about. Uh, this is just sort of orient, this is our D3 per head one, orienting us uh, to a different, uh, sort of different capsid shapes here. Uh, but there is much, much more to investigate uh, with the whole scaffold, with different sort of components of the scaffold. Um, so, lots of exciting work uh, to be done. Speaking of which, um, Alexi and Bob also are giving talks on Thursday uh, with sort of similar stories, related stories about uh, scaffolds and capsid sizes. Uh, Bob and I have posters that post this number uh, 10 and 14. And of course, I'd like to thank 
everyone in the Conway Lab, as well as um, collaborators for this project, uh, the NIH as our funding source and the organizers as well. And are there any questions? Presumably, you're going to add the extra residues to the HP97 to see if you can make it a tweak with nine particles. You guys thinking about that? Yeah, so James and I have been working recently. Yeah, we're, we're interested in maybe doing some of the demos as well in that location. So, do you need the full length scaffold to assemble? Yeah, uh, so Bob's going to be talking about uh, some mutation work um, with the scaffold. And you think it um, certainly has, has effects on how that's effect. And do you think that's due to restraining the top of it? I'm not sure. Uh, something I didn't talk about um, is that uh, a really key factor in assembly is the association of those long helices to each other. Um, we don't know exactly sort of when they come together, how they come together, once they come together, is it before or after the capsules have, have started joining? Uh, that, that's all quite unknown. Um, uh, yeah, we're interested in, in looking into those questions. Yes, that means what to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so coming back to sort of what is your name? Haley's question <coughs> before the lunch. So I, I'm a bit of an outsider to all this. So if the idea is that the T equals 9 um, <coughs> particles are rare because they've been sort of under, undersampled, is there a reason why they would be undersampled? Are they in difficult to culture organisms? Or could there be something you know, about the, the T equals 9 themselves? Yeah, uh, I think it's probably a variety of things. I don't think they're particularly hard to work with. I know some that we've worked with are harder than other to harder than others to look at at different stages uh, during assembly, like different curve patches that you feel are harder to work with. Um, so I don't think it's the case that they are inherently more unstable than any other capsule type. Actually, one of those T equals nine papers that I mentioned that came out, came out early last year. Um, it was a H pylori T equals nine phage, um, and they actually found it to be ultra stable. It's highly stable uh, in conditions of acid. It does contain extra cement proteins, um, that was the key in that. Um, but I haven't seen any evidence that I think proves or suggests that as a whole, T equals nine are more unstable than others. Why exactly they've been undersampled, I'm not sure if they're just less abundant, or evolutionary to be the case there, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why they've been a little bit undersampled. Um, as a whole. That's another question. I've got one last thing. Adding to the first question, so there would be the possibility to augment that loop steadily and see when you get the switch. So obviously you can have these two states, the Hong Kong state and the other state, but when, how much do you need to add? And you could quantify at every stage how much of each geometry you have so you get sort of an idea what the transition would look like. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really cool to do that. Um, okay. Yeah, we're interested in, in the variety of those yeah, Lovely questions. talk. Thank you so much. So, can we have Jonathan, please, and ask him? Yeah, so Jonathan is talking to us about hydromethylovirus. Please take it away. Hi, so my name is Jonathan G. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student in the lab of Hongo from UCLA. And today I'm going to be talking about structures and configurations of the human cytomegalovirus portal associated segment complex. So, briefly, human cytomegalovirus, or HCMV, uh, is a prototypical beta herpes virus. Uh, these are characterized by their slow replication. There's strict tropism for host uh, host species, however, uh, a very broad tropism for cell types within hosts. Um, that is very high scale prevalence. Most of us in this room probably have a CMV without really knowing it. Uh, although in healthy individuals, they're typically asymptomatic. Uh, however, in the young and in the immunocompromised, they are a leading cause of congenital defects and also complications when it comes to uh, AIDS patients or organ transplants accordingly. Um, so, HCMV, they have a 235 kilobase 
CSDNA DNA genome, which is by far the largest in the heritage viruses. A T equals 16 icosahedral capsid, uh, which has 12 vertices, one of which is a portal vertex. That is surrounded by this uh, largely amorphous uh, tegument layer, which has historically been loosely demarcated into this inner tegument and this uh, outer tegument. And then surrounding all of that is this envelope with assorted proteins. Now, as Anna pointed out earlier, uh, herpes viruses are also similar to bacteriophage cactus in that they have an HK97 like MCP fold. Uh, and also, this the dexameric portal through which DNA uh, translocates in and out of the capsid. Um, however, herpes viruses differ from phages in their life cycle. Uh, whereas phages are sort of a one stop stop, you can think of it as a um, post, post box where the phage uh, goes up to your host and then uh, it's one stop job delivers its package and then all is well. Uh, herpes viruses are kind of like the Los Angeles uh, DMV where you wait in line at the door, you go in, take a number, um, then you wait another couple of hours, and then finally you get to your destination. Um, so for herpes viruses, you have a couple of these events where first the virus initially enters the cell. Uh, that's followed by retrograde transport, which is predominantly minus 10 directed microtubule transport, uh, dining power. That's followed by the second uh, open sesame event, uh, which is NPC docking or nuclear pore complex docking. That facilitates the injection of the DNA, uh, of the double stranded DNA genome into the nucleus. There you have all your good stuff like acid assembly, um, DNA packaging, genome retention happening. That's followed by nuclear egress, and then this uh, very convoluted and not very well understood process of uh, interrogate, interrogate transport, which we do know involves uh, kinesin proteins, and finally leading to the exit of the DMV from the cell. And notably, all these processes that you see in red, uh, these are tegument driven processes. So, um, over the past 20 years, a lot of studies, uh, biochemical, genetic, functional, have gone into uh, trying to resolve tegument structures in the herpes virus uh, life cycle. So, suffice it to say, um, tegument is uh, really we understand, we understand it as the chief name through which herpes viruses navigate here the chaotic cellular environment. And it's a very specific role, uh, although a very broad role. Um, so the segment has a lot of function, but what about its structure? Well, recently we have in situ um, structures of the casted proteins of uh, many herpes viruses, and then also within the past uh, few years we've had glycoprotein structures. Uh, the segment has remained somewhat, somewhat of a mystery, and this is largely due to their lack of strong symmetry, their pyomorphic features, um, these are all uh, characteristics that are not very amenable to high resolution reconstruction. Um, and then finally, the fact that DNA is not shared with DNA, yes, DNA pages, so unfortunately, I can't speak off of the work that all you have done. Um, however, uh, Newcomb and Brown, um, they have uh, this group in particular, they've done quite a few uh, TM studies of Herpes virus tagging and notably, they um, visualize this asymmetric distribution of tegument around capsids, um, and also specifically these uh, tufts. Oh, there's a way to point it. Uh, these tufts, which emanate from these uh, detergent treated capsids, and this is significant, we'll come back to this later. So, on with that rationale, we now try to interrogate these in situ structures of the capsid associated in the inner tegument. Uh, we start off with cow ET, which, as we learned today, cow ET is great for ultrastructural and visualization. However, traditionally, it's been hampered by this uh, missing wedge. As you can see here in this uh, reconstructed tomogram of HPV particles, in Fourier space, due to the nature of the cow ET experiment, we have this missing wedge, and so we lose data in, the, uh, in these orthogonal views of the tomogram. Um, now, this brilliant machine learning prodigy in our group, named Yung Liu, uh, developed this program called ISOMET, which allows us to uh, recover the missing wedge in these tomograms. And so here in the bottom, you see that with this uh, ISOMET treated tomograms, we have um, pretty good recovery of this missing wedge. Now, this was really exciting because um, this really allowed us to enable for the first time, um, or observe for the first time, uh, direct features of a skin uh, structure in these tomograms. And so here we see we have our virions, and then here we have a NIF, which is a non-infectious uh, envelope particle. And you'll notice that in the asymmetric tegument buds, um, 
we notice, especially in all of the disks, these are a bit easier to see inside the capsule because they lack this electron um, dense core DNA. We can actually see the portal uh, clock to that asymmetric blood of sediment. And so doing a segmentation on one of these, uh, we see all of this a little bit clear. You can see blood proteins on the envelope. Uh, the green is the tegument, uh, asymmetric tegument. And then we see this uh, portal associated tegument complex decorating the portal to decimer. Next, we turn to single particle cryogen. Um, and for the sake of time, I won't go in depth into how we um, resolved all of these uh, structures that I will show you next. But suffice it to say, we have this uh, pretty convoluted workflow where first we classified our particles into HMG variants and YIST. Uh, then we did uh, symmetry realization to extract the portal vertex for variants and YIST. And then we had uh, sub subsequent sequential steps of subparticle classification in which we were able to finally uh, extract these five different configurations of this portal associated tagging complex. Um, so these are, there are two in the variants and three in the NIT, and these uh, loosely correlate to each other, or uh, are similar to each other. We have uh, variant configuration one and NIT configuration one, which can be thought of as analogs to each other. We have variant configuration two and uh, a subpopulation of NIT configuration two. And then very interestingly, we have this NIT configuration two inverted, which uh, is most similar to the viewing configuration to accept you have this entire structure inverted 180 degrees. Um, so briefly looking at the first configuration, this we colloquially term as the fully segmented portal vertex. Um, and so we'll notice that viewing uh, configuration one or VC1 and NIP configuration one or NC1, um, these exhibit pretty similar segmentation uh, although with one major difference. And that major difference is that because variants have packaged DNA, uh, this portal cap region is a little bit different from that of this, which uh, do not have to maintain that very high, highly, high amount of uh, pressurized DNA inside the capsule. And organizationally, uh, the entire structure can be broken down into three layers of tiny protein. We have layer one, again, that's uh, the portal cap. Uh, everything is a uh, tensimer of dimers. So layer one, we have the portal cap. And then we have the second and third layer, which are these dimers of PUL47 and PUL48, which are uh, still the largest tiny proteins in the Herbie Stars genome. So looking very quickly at layer one, which is the portal cap, um, again, this itself is split into an upper layer and a lower layer. Uh, the upper layer actually houses the uh, genomic termini that we see held in the translocation channel. Um, and suffice it to say, electrostatic interactions really characterize uh, portal cap structure and function. So we notice these alternating plus and minus charge grooves, uh, which really interlock this portal cap structure together. Presumably that's necessary because, again, it's you know, holding back this immense pressure of DNA inside the captive. Um, and then similarly here, uh, our genes and lysines are also at a discount whenever this virus came to be. Um, and we have this abundance of lysine residues and arginine residues lining this interior funnel of the portal cap. Um, and presumably that also helps to stabilize the genomic termini of uh, the genome. Layers two and layers three are characterized by these PUL 4748 uh, dimer interactions. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but if you guys want to know all the interesting mechanisms we found here, uh, you can find me at my poster. Uh, but the perhaps the most exciting is this uh, conserved WD4 motif, which uh, is a condition binding site first observed and uh, isolated in alpha, alpha free viruses, uh, which we also find here in our TBL48 HDMI copy. So moving on to Virion NIP, or sorry, Virion NIP configuration 2, uh, or VC2, NC2. Um, so this archetype, so VC2 is characterized by, um, relatively speaking, more disordered tagging elements. Uh, and this, you can see, reflected in the lower quality of, or lower resolution of the constructions that we have for these specific configurations. Um, NC2, which isn't shown, is similar to VC2 here. And then again, as I pointed out earlier, NC2 in, or inverted, is essentially this uh, inverted um, structure that puts on its back and then you have these uh, TBL 4748 dimers kind of loosely hanging on the top. 
Um, the important things to understand about all these configurations is that um, they're multi-configurational, and that is enabled by the uh, flexible linker uh, custom binding domains that we observe in all our projects. We call these linker CDDs, and so you have that's characterized by this globular uh, head domain, and then usually there's a long linker, and then you have this uh, captive binding domain, or CBD, which is anchored to the captive. So, uh, you know, think a bunch of balloons sort of tethered to uh, you know, someone holding these strings of the balloon. And so, uh, the configurational flexibility of all these structures, again, there's a lot, but uh, sort of simplifying them down to these two. Um, you know, we have these conserved head domain folds, uh, different sets of interactions that give rise to all our configurations. And again, this you know, head linker CBD mode that allows all these configurations to reorient, reorient as necessary um, throughout the life cycle of the virus. Now, if you recall those uh, HSP1, UL36, or a large tagging protein tuft that I mentioned earlier, uh, so increasingly, there's evidence that these tufts uh, really are the components that interface between the capsid and your motorized cellular proteins. Um, and it turns out in our subparticle reconstructions, we can actually see these tufts uh, emanating from each pair of PDL 47 48 dimers. Um, that then um, drove me to then get the uh, global reconstruction of the entire virus uh, with the portal vertex result. And it turns out in the global reconstruction, we can see the full length of these puffs. And they're kind of folded down, lying on top of the surface of the capsule. Uh, we then turn to alpha fold. So, uh, UL48, again, is the largest uh, encoded protein in the herpetovirus genome. And uh, our Kraliam structure covers uh, about this much of the entire sequence. And similarly, for UL47, we cover about this much of the entire UL47 sequence. Uh, but it turns out that the remaining uh, sequences of EL47 and 48 that we don't cover, these are actually very rich in coiled coiled helices, which turned out to be a very great prediction target for alpha fold 2. Um, so we generated a series of very high confidence uh, alpha fold 2 um, coiled coiled helix predictions, and then using rigid body fits, we were then able to uh, essentially dock these predicted sequences into these tufts that we observed lying on top of the capsid. And so, in our VC1 and MC1 configurations, um, we end up having these uh, tufts, which are, we call them filaments now, I guess, um, but they're approximately 5 nanometers in length, in width, uh, 45 nanometers in, uh, in length. Um, and, again, these account for nearly the entire length of the UL48 large tegmine protein, and they sort of uh, sit on top of the capsid. Um, and very interestingly, we also noticed this uh, unassigned fibular density, which is in context of putative uh, kinase combining uh, motifs. We're not exactly sure what this is yet, um, but that's an area that we're actively investigating. And then, intriguingly, in the uh, NC2 inverted configurations, uh, we actually do not see these uh, tops that were so prominent in the NC1 and NC1 configurations. Okay. Um, and so, this is really sort of the uh, first structural uh, confirmation that tufts uh, are indeed trafficking associated structures because, again, we're able to map them to the you know, Um So, in summary of the structural results themselves, we have uh, AI enhanced tomography, deals with asymmetric tagging of compartments across the portal vertex. We have all these configurations of the portal associated tagging complex. And then we have some mechanistic details of how these uh, components actually um, interact with each other. And since I'm a little bit early, um, I want to very briefly talk about how, what this all means, um, sort of in the context of a virus assembly, which is the uh, topic of our meeting. Uh, maybe this is some stuff that is more relevant to what everyone is studying. Um, so first off, uh, we believe with the structure, we filled in a little bit of the mystery that we had with the segment. Um, And so, we're, uh, you can think of this as slowly bridging the gap. Um, it's a very tenuous bridge right now, but we like to think of it as the first plank across this uh, gap between the capsid and the envelope. And uh, in the future, there are many more proteins that also facilitate uh, this bridging of the gap, which we would love to study. Um, secondly, we believe we've stumbled upon a unique viral solution towards traversing cellular architecture. 
Um, so if I may remind everyone, uh, the problem that we outlined earlier is that uh, there are many processes um, largely driven by the herpes virus pathogen need to transverse or uh, to move across the cellular architecture, namely the nuclear membrane, microtubules, um, you know, all these different organelles, uh, nuclear pore complex, etc. Um, and so um, I think we can illustrate these processes in sort of a two case studies using our data. Um, the first is that despite all these configurations of PAT C that we see uh, across the portal vertex, it turns out that the global tagging mutation of uh, all these different configurations are in fact rather conserved. And in fact, there's a very specific uh, pattern of global tagging mutation, which is that uh, if you take each of these uh, other vertices and you split them along their equatorial, segment has this very strong fur tendency to bind up the portal side of that equatorial. Okay. And so when we, um, you know, take this observation in line with uh, studies that have been done in the past, um, there is a whole wealth of uh, studies of nuclear pore complex stalking involving herpes viruses that show that it's absolutely essential that the portal vertex um, be crossed correctly to the pore, uh, to the nuclear pore complex. Uh, and so one can imagine how the preferred tagging mutation of all these vertices uh, might lend to this sort of docking uh, interaction, especially given that PL48 has very distinct uh, interactions with uh, nuclear pore components in PL77 as well. So, wrapping up here, um, our structure also um, makes sense with some existing uh, chemical data showing that the C terminus of the portal cap um, has to be exposed to the uh, central channel of the NPC in order for genome encoding to occur. And indeed, our C termini are, uh, in fact, exposed to the surface. Um, and then, I'm going to sort of skip to the end here. I'm so sorry, you really do need to do this. Okay. Yeah, so, give me a little bit of bonus. The uh, extra bonus stuff, if you guys are interested, uh, please come to my poster afterwards. I'd love to share the additional details of this with you guys. Um, and finally, I just want to acknowledge uh, the people in my lab. And so, thank you guys for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, I can take one quick question or so, please. Sorry. So you've got one chance in 12 to uh, point the five fold where the fourth one is at the core complex. Yes. Right. So you think that those cables picking out could be preferentially oriented to four complex at the core? Is that what you meant in the model? Yes, that is the thinking. So those preferred uh, tagging and binding that you see at the vertices, um, those are composed of those dimers with the long filaments that we, uh, we saw earlier. Um, and because we know that there is a very specific interaction between the UL48 protein, which is, again, the long filamentous protein, with these um, uh, nuclear pore in the 358 that sticks out. Um, so there's sort of a synergy of evidence here. So we, knew, we know that UL48 interacts with your motor proteins. We know that uh, nuclear pore in uh, 358 also interacts uh, with motor proteins as well, or microtubules, rather. Um, and so you can, one can perhaps envision this handoff of the herpes virus pathogen from the um, you know, motor proteins traveling along the microtubule uh, to the nuclear pore complex. And during that handoff, because of the preferred orientation of the segmentation, uh, that orientation is essentially already uh, stipulated in that. I hate to cut this short now because it's been a lovely talk, but I'm afraid in the interest of time, we will have to move on. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. The next speaker setting up for us is Chun Peng, David Ho. He's speaking of pseudonymous bacteriophage E217. Take it away. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I can't remember last time I speak in front of so many people. And yeah, um, I'm, I'm David Ho. Um, I'm a research scientist uh, at Jefferson and also a project manager. Um, you know, or uh, a study on the uh, genome genome lab. Okay, so um, today I'm going to give an uh, overview of the H27. So, okay, so, so uh, more stage, uh, H27 is some basic information about that. It's a PV1-like malvaridae. 
the genome size is about 66,000 test pairs. It's about one the size of the people. And it has 94 uh, operating designs. And each one seven has a long contact pair tail with six long tail fibers, about 900 or something. Um, I know it's it. And uh, each one seven is a bit of uh, fake. So, <coughs> so uh, this is the five type. Um, um, but as a fun of collaborator, um, Naomi Lab, and um, it was, uh, each one was used in an uh, experimental and fake cocktail lab against two or more. Um, yeah, it has like four uh, different phases to be like cocktail. So this is just a sneak peek of the uh, booty class of the whole thing. But I don't, I don't get that a lot of the, uh, <laughs> uh, the whole thing. So, uh, basically, the map is break down into different uh, regions of the base using localized reconstruction. So, next is the method. So, we break down to head, region, neck, tail, and base plate. So, um, um, so uh, we collect also the contact, uh, uh, contacted uh, equine seven. So, the, the world actually break down to um, so I, I, do, I do like half of the work and also a lab member of uh, Momo. Um, they uh, she, she did uh, most menu picking basically like took a lot of time and we tried to uh, decipher the, uh, the structure of the base plate and also she handles the uh, um, contracted um, employees. So, yeah. <coughs> so that's the uh, next portion. And it has, okay. yeah, from, um, from the class, you can see there's a major taxi protein. And when you reconstruct the, uh, um, the taxi, you find another uh, the decorating protein on top of the uh, taxi protein. And also, um, the neck has total protein. People had to tell uh, the adapt adapter just underneath the pro protein. And also color, pro color protein and general protein. I will go to uh, detailed structure in the uh, later slides. And also speed protein calcium. Okay. And for the base play, we have uh, calcium B. I mean, one unit of calcium B. And it's different from the calcium. The thing from the And we have uh, um, the draw, I mean, timer forms the timer of which. Group for one and two, and of half healthy. That, that's the center, um, the cap of the face plate. And then we have the CVK bundles, this initiator as the uh, uh, adapter, the uh, second layer of the uh, base plate. Then we have the two plates, one, two, and two, 45, called triple three. Um, and then there's the tail, long tail cycle. So this is contracted um, E27. So, uh, so we uh, adapted the uh, contracted method from our own lab. So we, so Momo introduced the alkaline buffer and incubate for several hours. Then it will induce um, the contraction of the pair. And um, the, um, the quality of the sample is uh, it's worse than the native form because it, it gets a lot of uh, DNA and also uh, background and proteins. And it's more fragile, so we, we found many headless tail, contracted tail in the uh, um, inner sample. Okay, so um, protein that has dramatic chance is like the total protein plus the, uh, I mean, it's not like this disorder. The, uh, the barrel is installed, maybe like a flower open up, and the gateway protein, um, the orientation is different. Yeah, it, it, the, uh, the loop is contracted with the stick protein we'll talk about later. Okay. And also, the, uh, the base play is separated into two parts. The, uh, the cap still at the tip of the, the tube, and the two legs move up all together with the stick. Yeah, and the uh, uh, <laughs> Okay, so this is the atlas of the uh, joint segment. So it has the expanded state and the contracted state. 
Uh, so the head is about uh, 750 so in diameter, and this is the key to my um, um, face. And we have the snag, and the uh, expanded sleeve is about 1250 so and so and just contact me with this is about half of the, uh, the length of from the edge of this yeah. Okay, and the base play is about 180 yeah, in extended form. And this is all the FSB we, uh, we reconstruct uh, from the data. And um, basically, we, um, we do localized reconstruction, and this analysis I put I stuck in all the stitching, all the, uh, um, all the math together, and so makes that up. Um, yeah. Okay. So, also, this all the uh, protein we found um, in this work. So, there is 19 proteins, but, uh, but actually 18 different uh, amino acid um, peptides because the, the um, the triple like GB44 plus the A and B different confirmation. So just quickly uh, go through the capsid uh, components, the uh, capsid proteins, um, canonical, it's K97 fold, so from the other phase is nothing very special. So he also has two different uh, confirmations, like 6 four and 5 four vertex. And um, when we do that research, the most similar um, testing protein is the TW1 testing protein. And then there's a decorating protein. We have 180 copies of the decorating protein. That's based on the three fold, every, every single three fold of the, the surface of the testing. This forms like the center layer of the capsule, and you also support the tail of contact with the, uh, the which we say head to tail uh, protein. So, so, so I'm just go from head, neck, and keep going down. So next thing is the uh, neck portion, and we we have pro protein, is the dotama and head to tail. The green one is the hammer and also color, gateway color. Color is like the uh, um, gap between the uh, seat, of, I mean, the, the hammer and the, uh, and the gateway uh, head summer. Then uh, the gateway directly contact with the seat and the, uh, the tube. Okay. So, we, so when we look at the um, contacted portal, we thought, oh, maybe the, uh, the, the gating would be different, but it's actually it's very similar. So we, we, we did not find, we don't, we don't find any uh, really that good that gating the, uh, the DNA. That's kind of surprising. But, yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk about the uh, gateway and speed uh, interaction. So uh, this is the top down view from. Um, yeah, top down view. So, so before um, contraction, the uh, the right is the gateway C terminal arm is behind the C beta tiny, and once okay, once upon contraction, the the gateway C arm move to the front of the C beta tiny, and because the loop over here. Very flexible. Uh, I don't. I find the infinity um, density after contraction. Okay. So, so this is the movie um, of um, most in camera. <laughs> but it's not just saying it's not. Maybe it's not real because you will see the the arm. The arm will just cross, will just go over the uh, the screen. So let's play this. Go through, but it's actually the, the arm of the seat is very flexible. I, uh, I assume that you will just open up and let the, uh, the gateway protein to go. 
go around. Right? <laughs> right, right. So uh, I'm showing that this folding in online structure and this is before contraction and after the contraction. So before contraction, the descendant tone is 75 strong. After contraction, it's the uh, one tone. One twenty is also so you will dissociate the um, the center cube and it still fit to um, um, conformer together in stack of you can see the uh, especially the internal arm um, is twenty four and point away and split uh, eighty degrees is actually downward and you also have flexible the terminal arm. Um, and the beta can is also moving. But in fact, so in fact, for um, because it's a really complex system, uh, we found that three units from the a trimer that more, makes more sense. So, um, so usually you will label like uh, this is this a uh, uh, trimer, right? So you usually label like A, C, and so forth. But uh, I just put A and B and C together. So, so I am B and C from uh, beta to complex at the uh, this region. So initially is like the um, almost ninety percent of work. Then upon contraction, so it goes flat. So, so yeah. Um, so A and B in this orientation doesn't really change too much. Just tilting up and C will go flat. So it turns out going sixteen point six degree clockwise if you see this direction. Yes. And it compressed. So it tends to it tends to be it's more like a mass. You can see holes in between like every uh, timer. And the contraction state is very compact. Then we ha I, I have more for for the uh, 34 units, that's all the units. And the first four, because I can anchor the dead weight. So uh, it's, this may be a little bit more accurate of the motion of the state of this just showing of yeah. So like these three units work together and press upward. See this is not correct, it's more thing. And I and I don't really know if like in the real um, in the real world it just compress upward. Like because the bottom unit move faster than the upper upper uh, unit, but this is just showing no I'm in real. Then, then is the cube uh, protein. So cube protein has 33 units. So the, the last unit that the test to the base plane is B, perfect B. And so this is bottom up view. So one um, tail tube unit make contact with two cube protein. That is the base plane continuous structure. So we uh, visualize base plane into three layers. So maybe it's more easier to follow. Um, so the first layer is the base plane cap. It has 18 subunits. So, um, so uh, right down of the tail tube is the uh, tail tube B of this blue one, blue guy. And that is the pistol. Dimer into timer of the rich code one and two. That is the half and it's the peak. Next, if we add the uh, second layer, is the adapter layer. We have uh, this initiator that attached to C and also the um, the rich code. And we have the finished bundle. That is very interesting because the uh, heat bundle, so yeah, the rich hole one and two 
has two has one uh, one is has arm to hold the hinge bundle like an egg, and uh, hinge bundle doesn't interact with itself. It's like like the ripple just left and right holding the egg. <laughs> anyway, okay. So then the third layer is the base plate nut. It has 18 subunits. It's uh, it's all these things. And uh, we have CP forty four A, B, the triplex uh, A and B, and the C forty five to triplex unit C. So CP forty four A is as they call it these things because um, the, it has the kingdom and kingdom man are so related. It's like um, the chairperson is cleaning up on you. You have to find. Oh, really? Can you come wrap it up nicely? Okay. You don't have to. Yeah, it's almost. Yeah, it's almost done. Yeah. Let, let's see the uh, <laughs> movies. Yes. So first you have the uh, TV, the top one, two, and then the uh, top and the tape. And then you have the. Yeah, okay. okay. Faster. It's a seed initiator and chemical bundle you can see it's holding the X. Then it's a triple X A, B, and C, triple X three. Oh, that's the last layer of the C on top of it. That's so, fast forward. So this is the triple X. So um, this is another angle during your base. Um, um, this is the pin domain that they will contact with the tip and the hub. It's actually holding the the hub for okay. it, and it has three really different conformations of this one. So uh, we 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 think that the uh, the, the contact surface is like uh, right. Okay, it's thirty thirty eight percent more interface area um, to the GV forty five. So let's make this two. Um, in very different combination. Okay, so then is the triple X before and after contraction. So it expands more than like about twice, and but the overall diameter is only increased fifty percent. Okay, now right. is the uh, yeah. like I said before, the uh, upon contraction, the base plane not upward and the uh, cap is still at the bottom. But uh, to be so the three 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 we did we did not find in the base plate catalog after contraction. And this is the uh, predictive model of the tail fiber. Only the first three hundred forty uh analysis has low density. You can see the beads. The chairperson is dead serious. Okay. One, one last thing. So so uh, we uh, our collaborator Rami also done the um also a uh, attachment uh, experiment experiment about the point stability. So oh, um he made a new of four A, four A. Uh in point seven cannot contact with four A and because we found that the uh the OAP gene is missing uh at four A this mutant. So if you incubate we extract they extract LPS of the uh pop is maybe uh well type one but it will block the tail fiber receptor but not hydrolyte thing. So um yeah. Anyway, so this is our conclusion that the model of the uh, uh, signal to suction of each one. So the tail fiber uh, is wiggling, is swimming, and, and once it's contact with all antigen, and there's uh, more than two contact with the, uh, the LPS plus the all antigen, the, the tail fiber will pull the pin domain and release. Um, the contract. And you really have to come Okay, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I want to thank all the members in a single line lab and also our collaborator in Recap Online, and this is found by NIH. Uh, and we thank the NIH uh, uh, and the uh, uh, KCG to collect our uh, EM data. <laughs> Thank you.
take one quick question, please. And then we have to move on. Um, anybody there for a quick question? Uh, very nice talk. Uh, quick question about the sheet contraction. Do you think this occurs um, starting from the top, closer to the head of the page, from the tail? Do you think it's symmetric? Do you think it's sporadic? How do you think it's yeah, I think this story will. It looks like the uh, springs. If you pull the springs and you release the springs, what will it happen? But, but, but the face is, do you think it's anchored at the LPS? On the, so once the power is released, you will contact. So, um, but for Kalyan analysis, I can only anchor at the gateway protein. No, no, I think I'm asking you, how do you envision it happening? Do you think the entire thing shrinks at the same exact time? Or do you think there's like little areas that start to be breaking, like coming closer and then it just ripples across? Good question. So I think I don't. I think experimental method is just like a hypothesis. Okay. Oh, there is lovely modeling, maybe I can jump in here. So there is modeling by Richard James on these lattice transitions, the Martin side transition, Martin City transition, and would come from the bottom up. Usually, okay. so it's actually there's lovely modeling that you might want to have a look at. So okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> And we have Sarah Whitmer coming to talk about taking one into the last virus. Take it away. Okay, so it's lovely to see you all here. Um, and it's a real pleasure today to be able to introduce some work that we've been working on all four or five years, isn't it louder? Um, on tick borne encephalitis virus maturation. So, this one is cephalitis virus. I mean, it should have HK97 fold, but it doesn't. Sorry about that. Um, instead, it's a flavivirus. Um, flaviviruses are usually the ones you're familiar with, are those which are really transmitted by mosquitoes, but we're interested in one that transmitted by ticks. It's a positive RNA stranded virus with a linear non-segmented genome. It makes these envelopes like it's usually symmetric particles and it's causing meningitis and encephalitis. I'm interested in it because it's endemic in Finland and Asia, uh, Austria, Sweden, you know, places I like to go. And so we are investigating it. So, in terms of its life cycle, if we just consider the human cells, so it's entering via an endocytic route, and release of the genome is triggered by the low pH of the endosome. So pH is important in this life cycle. And it's assembling actually within the ER, and Lowry has a poster on the assembly step, which is with the, uh, nu uh, the nucleic acid protein C and the RNA, and about the interactions that are required for that. So please plug the poster number six. Um, but in this talk, we're going to concentrate on the two different types of the virus that you get once you form a particle, the so-called immature particle, and the mature particle. In order to go from one to the other, there has to be proteolytic cleavage, so it's almost like a stage, of the, one of the captured proteins, um, or sorry, one of the envelope proteins, and there has to be exposure to low pH. And really the question is, um, what are the differences in the structure between these two and does it help us to understand what this maturation pathway looks like? So, this is a classical structure of a flavivirus in that the surface of the capsid is made up of these rafts. The rafts are um, heterotetramers of two proteins, the envelope protein, which is the majority of the protein that you see here, and a minor 
protein called M or membrane protein. So the E protein, which you see, is stacked in the rats, and the it has a envelope, it has a membrane helical arrangement, which is supported by the M protein helical uh, domain. And so you've got a big membrane component and then a big exogenous component. In terms of typical encephalitis virus and how it looks a little bit different to other flaviviruses that have been studied, we found that the stabilization of these rats in the surface of the virion, they are also helped by the interactions Helped by interactions in the uh, membrane proteins, so you actually have these base stacking interactions and salt bridges which come together to bring different hetero. Tetramers. I'll get that fly. <laughs> hetero tetramers together, <laughs> and you notice you can only have that in one particular position, and then you have a big gap. All right. Um, and this is something which is not found in any of the other flaviviruses. It seems to be very specific to tick-borne viruses. And what we noticed was that it wasn't present in uh, an adapted, uh, cell-adapted strain of TBV, which is often used as a model system for hyper. And that structure was solved earlier by uh, a group and did not show its particular what we can also resolve from the virion structure is the presence of organized uh, lipids, so phosphatidyl choline molecules, the ones that we modeled, into these densities, which are these are lipid molecules which are basically organized through interactions with the peripheral membrane helices. Of e. And there's some nice work by he I, um, Franz Feins, who has mutated probably every residue into the life virus. And uh, he's shown that the, there are essential chips and histidine residues which are around these lipid molecules, and if you mutate them, you no longer assemble the virus. So they seem to be important. Um, and when seeing these sorts of molecules, you think, well, maybe these could be drug targets, etc. But we also want to see, are they fat present then in this immature virus particle, or is it something that's only there after maturation? And so we want to look at what happens in maturation. So we have ended up teaming up with Plebka's group. We've been working independently on these projects, and when we found out, we decided to collaborate. And so, I'm going to show you a cohesive, hopefully, story, um, which brings together three different sets of data, with a lot of this done independently, and then we compared and decided on what the consistent story. All right. So here we have electron micrographs of three different isolates. Good cell 14, which is the one we work with, is not a cell adaptive strain. This is passage 2 that we work with. New dorsal, which is very similar to good cell which is what uh, Plesko was working on. And then also hyper that we're working on as well, which is cell adaptive strain. So these are produced by actually taking a normally infected cell, but then throwing in ammonium chloride, preventing the maturation of the virus because you prevent the change in pH of the Golgi, and therefore you can isolate these non-infectious immature particles. When we did that, and we did uh, 2D classification of those particles, what we end up with is something that looks a bit weird. It's not very regular. It's well-defined on one side and not on the other side. 
and we could never actually really classify that out into different and into other things. Uh, it turns out this has also happened in Plevka's lab as well. So you have some parts, some classes where you have clearly defined spikes that are a little bit fuzzy on one side in both Moodle and Typo. However, one can, by the magic of hypersedural reconstruction, you could ignore all of that. And just like you can ignore the portals in, in uh, any decent failed bacteriophage, uh, you can apply a cohesion symmetry and you can then dissolve the structures of these immature particles. And you see immediately they look very different to mature particles, they're very spiky. And the spikiness comes from the presence of an additional small peptide called PR, which is part of the PR. M protein, and um, despite taking very large data sets, we had around uh, 300,000 particles that went into this reconstruction. We could only get these two particles to around seven angstroms resolution. That suggests that there is something limiting that resolution, um, and then actually hypo didn't even go that far. But what does it tell us? It tells us that we have a huge reorganization of these two proteins that make the heteropetronas in the mature virus. So these are colored for your entertainment, so you might be able to follow what's going on here. So um, we have basically these three different uh, dimers in yellow, blue, and red in the mature form. And here in the immature form, they form these very different sort of threefold spikes, which is something that sometimes detected with antibody studies a very long time ago. There's a transition between dynamic and climate form. Right, so um, it tells us a little bit. It tells us that we need to interpret this spike at higher resolution and maybe we can get more out of it. Um, but we can also look inside at central sections of the immature and the mature form of the virus, and we can compare grossly what's happening. So here's the ectodomains of E. You see you make this very smooth particle. In the case of the immature, you have this extra peptide M, but also actually the whole angle of these ectodomains is completely different. So they're standing up in the immature form and they're lying down on the surface of the membrane in the jaw. The blue area here, you can see the outer and inner leaflet of the membrane. And these are trans the transmembrane helices going through from E and N. And you can see how they cluster in particular regions in the membrane. And that gives the mature CBV, the classic sort of very angular membrane form, which is then changed dramatically in the immature form because here we have the alpha leaflet and here we have the inner leaflet. And you can already see from, I hope, from this central section that the distribution of those transmembrane helices is completely different. All right? And that also has to be then accommodated in these maturation models. So just to emphasize that, what we've done now is to strip away the top of the virus and just show you the positions of the peripheral and transmembrane helices in the immature and the mature form. This is the position of one wrap in the mature form. And Oh, I can't even make it out, the position of one trimer in the immature form. So just looking at those membrane helices, you really see that we've got big movements. And it's not just the M membrane proteins that have moved, but it's also the E. It's especially the E proteins. Um, so we thought it was quite important that we could actually link the exo domain to the membrane protein domain in order to see actually who is moving where. And so we used here the icosahedral reconstruction to pull out the exo domain of the PR 
um, M membrane domain of the three different positions within the immature particle for all three viruses. And in these, in, in these uh, lower resolution microcathedral reconstructions around eight or nine angstroms, it's really possible to see that indeed there is a linkage between these and it's consistent between all three viruses and between all three of the different uh, versions or flavors of those proteins. So we're very, very confident of the assignment of this particular membrane domain with this particular head domain. Right. So we have the icosahedral reconstruction, um, but obviously we need to go into an asymmetric reconstru reconstruction and we need to find out what's happening and why we've got a limited re uh, resolution. So this is one of the very first C1 reconstructions that Matthew did. And you can see that we've got a huge area of the surface of the membrane, which is, doesn't appear to be covered. In fact, even this, in this very preliminary data, um, it's almost like there are two full pentons that are missing off the surface. Um, well, <laughs> this is where it was very good to compare notes, because it also turned out that this was the book they'd also found out in Glefka's lab. And so, at least we were producing these viruses separately. We have three different isolates, and we see in all three isolates. Of course, it can still be due to purification, but I wondered whether it was due to, say, air water interface interactions destroying the virus. Um, so, what we did was then to do localized reconstruction using this uh, little spike to try to pull out more information from the micrographs and then to resolve the structure. But you can also use that spike to go into tomograms and see what's happening in uh, a virus by virus. Uh, analysis. And this is what uh, Dibor has done. This might run. Oh, my God. There we go. So this is a tomogram of the immature virus particles. You can see them appearing here. It's quite a mixed bag of things in this particular com uh, tomogram. But then what Dibor's done is gone in and done template matching within those individual immaterial particles to see, well, are they always distorted on the side next to the water interface, or does it vary throughout the preparation? And it turns out it varies throughout the preparation. What you're seeing in red and yellow are the scores of the template matching. But the point to take from this is that there is a lot of heterogeneity in this. Really, a lot of heterogeneity. <laughs> So maybe we cross out that TBV is not a cost All right. Uh, anyway, it turns out that by using this localized reconstruction, it is possible to really improve the signal that we get from the spike and, in fact, manage to pull it down to uh, just under four angstroms for two of the viruses. The high first strain didn't work, but it did for these two others. And so this is now an atomic model of the prm 3 e 3 spike. It's a really touchy, feely name, uh, which you'll probably remember. And so what we're showing in different colors are the 1E in yellow, pink, and blue. The paler colors are the E. The darker colors are the associated PRM protein, which goes from the top of the spike all the way down to the membrane. The membrane is sitting about here. And will this movie run? This movie will run as well. Excellent. So you can rotate this spike. Here are the PR peptides sitting on the top. Let's remove them. And if you remove them, you see that actually these three E proteins that come together don't actually come together. They have virtually no uh, contact area. In purple, you see the fusion loop, which is required for fusion with the cell membrane. It's nicely capped by these PR peptides. And here in turquoise, you can see 
these so-called pure and cleavage sites. This is what's going to cleave off this PR peptide from M during maturation. If we look at electrostatic interactions between the E and M, which are most tightly in contact with each other, we can see that this interaction is purely electrostatic. What about other interactions? So then if we look at just one spike, we see that two of the three heterodimers within the spike, they're virtually in a twofold orientation to each other. And then you have the odd ball on the side. The whole thing is held together by PR-PR interactions. It's not held together by other things. If you look at the interaction between these two PR peptides, then this is a high, it's a, it's a hydrophobic interaction. Um, it's one large one um, for the dimer form. And then this additional PR peptide fits in, in a different position, um, but it's also basically the glue allowing these two E molecules to come together. So this is going to be a very metastable structure. Um, let's see if I can be able to on that. And if we look, so again, I'm just orienting you here down in the corner, we have just one of these PR and E dimers, where you have the fusion loop in purple, and again, the pure and cleavage loop here. So PR peptide is sitting at the top of the spike, and then it runs down in a hydrophobic pocket down the side of E, and this is the pure and cleavage site, which we can see rather well, and so that's really stabilized by hydrophobic interactions, and there's a couple of side bridges as well. So, that's nice. How does maturation occur? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so, for maturation to occur, we absolutely need to cleave the peptide at this peptide cleavage site. So, it's hardly visible or um, in the climate form. But actually, when the virus collapses down itself to make the virion, this urine cleavage site is sitting underneath E, right next to the membrane. So it's even more inaccessible. The theories in the field say that we need both urine cleavage and pH in order to release this BR peptide, and that the maturation, the, the Virus first assumes a new conformation and then the urine site is cleaved. And I'm afraid I, dis I beg to disagree, but I don't have any proof. We do know that if we take the isolated virus, um, we can indeed cleave it and change the pH and get more. So finally, as the chair has told me to finish, uh, what about this sort of who might go where in terms of confirmation change? So what we did was to look at the interfaces that would be formed in these rat structures and said where are they in the immature particle? So where are these interfaces here? And we see them, there's one interface here and there's one, one interface here. These are the two uh, PR, uh, PREs that will form this dimer here. And so you can imagine that they could just slide into place. But obviously the blue one is going to make a huge change. Um, in terms of what's in the literature at the moment, there's an insect virus called Binjari where we have a similar organization of the transmembrane regions um, and the uh, PRME. Uh, John also has a structure from Sponwani where they have allocated a different set of transmembrane regions to this particular uh, 
structure, I think that at least we are on the Binjari side. And there is a <laughs> there is a movie of the maturation of Binjari from the Newton paper in 2021, which has the great Chimera X. I can go through myself in terms of proteins copying each other. Um, so there's a wild dance going on here, which we're obviously not going to run now because we have to finish. But let's go to conclusions that. The peptides are critical in the formation of this immature virus, uh, which is very metastable. It's so metastable that actually we see lots of these sort of incomplete particles in tomograms. Um, we have extensive movement of helical membrane domains in order to form the mature virion. The little pockets that were seen in the mature virion are not seen in the immature. Um, so they might still be. Uh, Potential antiviral target, um, but this OG pocket found in crystallized these structures is probably not. Um, this, the asymmetry of the immature particle may be due to budding or sample preparation, at least it's not due to the air water interface in the prior year. Um, and also, what we've done is we've analyzed and see on the variants, and there the vast majority are complete. So they come out at about 99.4% completely covered. But we can find 0.6% which are missing two cases. Uh, and then this, what we expect is actually that the nucleation of the conformational change on the virus of the immature is most likely starting perhaps at these surfaces where you already have a slightly disordered set of PRMEs and you'll actually spread out and propagate the conformational change from one point rather than trying to move everything at once. To me, it doesn't really make sense. The virus will probably have to grow. And I think there's another intermediate stage that we don't have. So, Masha, Lauri, Sarah, Bati, Alka, we're all heavily involved in Helsinki in this work. We collected the data in Skylife Lab as well as in Helsinki. Oli gave us the food salon. And then this nice joining of what could have been a big uh, <coughs> fight uh, with Bubbles Group on uh, the whole structures really has led to, I think, uh, a really nice uh, couple of papers that we're putting together now. So they've been working in SciTech and they work with Daniel Bruce's uh, group in the Veteran Research Institute. Thank you. Great talk, Sarah. Um, did, did I hear the uh, the uh, as a track that you try to enzymatically convert the image of our code? Yeah. Yeah, so we can we can do that and we can follow that just by a gel analysis. Right. And so we did that uh, with increasing pH. So we already see that the purine cleavage site is accessible at a pH of a, uh, just over 7. And it uh, gets it's faster if you go to, high, to a lower pH. We have obviously tried to look at that in the microscope, and they're all fused. Uh, so we haven't managed to pull that out. But I'm pretty certain that's something that has to be done. Uh, yeah, great talk. Um, I'm interested in the fuzzy bit. So in your, mm -hmm. in your class average view, which is the yeah. projection, you clearly see the ones that look like they're in um, semi-mature state. Is there anything resolvable in the, on the fuzzy side of those particles, like maybe just a population of E that hasn't, hasn't made it to the point where it's yeah. not the PR protein? Yeah, so that, that's, I was, uh, uh, this was one of the questions that we were sort of having. But, you know, how do you analyze that particular region. Localized reconstruction is based on you being able to recognize something that's very distinct. If you try to do localized reconstruction on the virion, it doesn't work because it's such a smooth structure. And so I asked uh, Tibor to look particularly at the tomograms to see if you see any evidence for protein in those sort of gappy areas. And it really looks like there is actually a like, but the membrane is there. Oh, okay. 
mean, just in the general, just fill up the quantum field. I mean, are those possibly particles that are just never quite make it? In, in other words, it's similar to that. How do you end up with 99.4% having the full thing when I mean, the ones that came out are... Yeah, so remember that we are not looking at this in situ. We are obviously doing purifications. So I can only tell you that 99.4% of what we purify is in that state, but we obviously have enriched for that particular class of viruses. But on the other hand, now we have another uh, very, very similar virus that we've been looking at, and we have really stripped back down all the purifications. So it's basically, take it from the supernatant, use a matrix that absorbs everything apart from the virus, and put that stuff on the grid, and it looks even better. But we haven't done it with immature. Here. Hi. Uh, question about the energetics of the process, because during the maturation also the virus has to compress and the, this passes in the, in the membrane appear only in, in the mature form. So do you, how do you envision this, the, the, the energy necessary for a compression of that? So, there is actually no compression. The difference is, I mean, so actually in terms of, the, because we were kind of interested whether the membrane, for instance, is changing, but in terms of the surface area, the membrane looks very similar. So basically, um, what you've got is that you've got this PR peptide that comes off completely, and you've got a very open structure which then starts to lay down, but there are very open structures, there's actually a lot of space on the surface for those to come together. So I don't think compression is happening, um, but I don't have any answers really on, on anything other than you've got these two states. Is that a I'm here all week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, going back to that, the tomogram, I thought it yes. was an ingenious idea to just simply temperature matching to figure out you know, the state of the molecule. But yes. What if you were to run temperature matching with the, with the mature form and, and see if you can yeah. determine the... So we obviously tried it, but because the mature form is really smooth, it doesn't work. Yeah. Thank you. So, have you tried to plot to a distribution of the degree of completeness of your particles, see if there is a solid angle that is open? Yeah, so, so Tibor has been looking at that. I don't have the results here to show you, but um, the most common incomplete form appears to be that we have effectively um, two of the fivefold missing, and then there's actually an additional pair of um, spikes sitting between those, and they are actually lying down. Um, and then in the, in the mature form, we see something similar. So we see when, when we see particles which have a complete membrane, then we see if there's something missing, it seems to be two pencils again. And that's without applying any symmetry. Is there an interpretation of this result? Well, so we're writing the first paper, which is on the like high resolution atomic structure, and then you know, Lev is writing the second paper on what some of the things. 